Hello! How is everybody? We are about to go live with Adobe Bridge. Oh, wow. So much chat. Right. I'm going to catch up with the chat later uh, and we're going to have Q&A later. So put all your questions in. I see we've already got some questions and uh, we will get going. Get going. So I am pressing certain buttons at my end and then I will press another button and we'll be able to see the slides. Hmm, or not. There we go. That was better. OK, hello officially, everybody, and welcome to Adobe Bridge 2021. It's the fifth week of our Mad March series uh, and we're wrapping it up with Bridge. Right. If you have never heard of me, I'm Elaine Giles. I'm a longtime computer trainer, podcast host and even a radio presenter on a Saturday night. I work with macOS, iOS and Windows and all types of apps, particularly, and I know this is Adobe, but particularly Affinity Designer, Affinity Publisher and Affinity Photo, but also Scrivener, Microsoft Office and even Adobe Creative Cloud at times. Right. We broadcast in 1080p. Make sure that you are watching in 1080p. YouTube does do strange things every now and then, including putting me on my 27 inch iMac into 360p mode. And I'm wondering why it's all blurry. How you do that is there is a cog in the lower right hand side and you need to see a red flash on it if you want HD. So click on the, the cog and you will get some options. And while you're down there, if you enjoy it, give us a like. It really makes a difference on YouTube. And you can subscribe. If you subscribe, they will pr they promise they will let you know uh, when we're live or when we have something scheduled to be live at some point. OK, so burning question of the day I'm suspecting is why Adobe Bridge? when I'm so clearly in the affinity camp. But for full disclosure, uh, I was an Adobe user group manager. So I have used Adobe for ooh, over 25 years, almost 30 years. But why Bridge, I even if you are an affinity user? Well, it's cross-platform. And the next question that follows with why Bridge is, well, why not Adobe Lightroom? Adobe Lightroom is fantastic. Adobe Lightroom is the reason I bought a Mac 2006. It came out in beta. I was on Windows. There was no Windows beta. I bought a Mac to use it. Lightroom's fantastic. But Lightroom is for images and solely for images. I know it has a little bit of support for video, but it's not fully fledged. So Bridge supports multiple file types. And I don't just mean multiple image formats and, and video. It also supports all of the applications within the Creative Cloud, InDesign, Illustrator, the whole thing. Anything that you use in Creative Cloud, you can view the files in Bridge. It acts as a hub in Creative Cloud to pass files around from app to app or from Bridge to one app, back to Bridge and then on to another app. It also supports other formats, including EPS, PDF, you name it. Also, it's completely free. It didn't used to be, and people may still have the mindset that it's not free, but it is free. However, getting hold of it and getting it installed completely free, mm, there's a few issues. So I'll take you through those. But all you need to do is go to adobe.com slash product slash bridge dot HTML. You will see that. And from there, there is the big download button at the top. So that's where you need to go. There's a QR code for it. Now, you will click the download button if you are. You will already have Bridge installed, probably, if you've got Creative Cloud. If you haven't, if this is your first Adobe product, then what might seem a bit strange is rather than just download Bridge, Adobe will tell you they are downloading Bridge. But what will happen is it will actually download something called the Install Creative Cloud and Bridge app. And the first thing it will want to do is it will want you to sign in with your Adobe ID. Now, don't run away screaming if you're not an Adobe user at that point, because an Adobe account is completely free. Once you've done that, they will ask you to verify your identity. Uh, they will send you a code. You just type the code in. Once you've typed the code in, you put your password in and then you're good to go. 
this thing confused me initially. And I thought, what, what's all this? Um, that I can get some kind of um, magic thing where I don't need my password. Basically, it's an app and it will send you a code rather than you using password. So I said no to that and carried on. Now, notice what's happening at this point. It's installing Creative Cloud and Bridge. And what it means is the way Creative Cloud works is it installs an overarching application called Creative Cloud. And then you can install underneath that all of the apps from the Creative Cloud suite. So I've got a full subscription. When I come to install Bridge, I'm probably going to install Photoshop and maybe a couple of others, InDesign maybe. But if you want the free version, you will have Creative Cloud installed, but it isn't a subscription version. It is just the mechanism by which they install Bridge. When you're going through the install, it will ask you questions. Um, I think I skipped most of them, but you might not want to skip them. You might actually want to complete these questions because what they're going to do is set Bridge up for you with some tutorials based on what you do and your level of knowledge with it. You know, how familiar are you with Bridge? If you say you've got extensive experience, then it's not going to show you like, you know, a beginner's guide to bridge. But if you've never used it before, then you can tell them you've never used it before and you will get those introduction to bridge videos as soon as you've installed it. Right. Once it's finished, if you're on a Mac, you're going to have all these permission issues that go on and on. Once they're through, you get to see this. And this is actually Creative Cloud. So if you've never seen Creative Cloud, if you're on one of the older versions where it's a um, perpetual license, this is what Creative Cloud looks like. Within this application, you will see just underneath there at the bottom, available in your subscription and it lists what's available. Now, this wasn't my installation. This was Mike's installation. And the reason that my other half kindly let me use his account to install it was what is available in your subscription, even though you, Mike doesn't have a subscription. There's no subscription. The applications that are listed under available in your subscription are completely free to use. So you could also download XD if you wanted to, which is a prototyping application. And there's Aero and there's Premiere Rush. So there's a whole range of applications that you will be offered. They are not automatically installed. The automatically installed ones are at the top and there will only be two if you do this with Bridge. One will be Bridge and one will be Camera Raw. All the other things will be available as an option, but not automatically installed. Uh, then there was a lot more permissions required and we finally ended up with this, which is the Adobe Bridge, uh, the uh, Creative Cloud application. So as I said, the only two that are installed are Bridge and Camera Raw. And because they've only just been installed, they are up to date. But if an update comes out in the future, this is where it will tell you about it. And then underneath that, you have the three other applications that are part of Creative Cloud, but completely free, XD, Rush and Aero. And then below that, there are the trials. So you can take a trial version of any application from the Creative Cloud. Um, and you install it from the same place, this overarching uh, Adobe Creative Cloud application. Right, but you're interested in Bridge. This is what happens when you get Bridge installed. So this window that you're seeing in the middle, or the smaller window, where it's saying what's new, it's telling you what's new, but you've also got the learn more options in there. And again, all of the tutorials that are available to you would be based on what quite what, how you answered those questions that you were asked. Right, that's it for those. There will be a Q&A at the end and um, I will be able to see some of the chat and Mike will, will poke me with a stick if there's something critical to answer at that point. But Mike will be collecting the questions that you've got ready for the Q&A at the end. So do post the questions in any time as you think of them. And we will head off and have a look at Adobe Bridge. OK, how are we doing so far? Uh, any pressing questions right now? Oh, happy Easter to you all. Good point. Happy Easter. That won't work on video, will it, on catch up? But never mind. Uh, happy next Easter. Trevor wanted to ask. Just a minute. No one can hear you, Mike. If you're going to speak, let me know. Right. Trevor wanted to know if he can upgrade to a newer version of Bridge and still use it with CS6. I don't see why not, but you might want to check that. Um, would it overwrite the version of Bridge you've got? 
it shouldn't do because they've been very careful with that, not to overwrite things. I mean, even within the Creative Cloud itself. So it's not unusual for me to have three versions of Photoshop installed just because I didn't uninstall the others um, rather than it overwrite it. So I would say check, but you should be able to. They've been very good at not overwriting things. What I will say is the only thing to think about is that that is quite an old version uh, and maybe it might overwrite that one. So I would check, but it certainly doesn't overwrite. Um, the new Creative Cloud does not overwrite existing Creative Cloud apps. You can run them side by side. So I'd say it, it's probable you'd be OK with that. Right. We've got any others right at the beginning? No. OK. Right. What you're looking at is Adobe Bridge in default view. I know it looks shocking. <laughs> right. This is the essentials view. But the reason it looks a bit weird in terms of the middle bit, which is the bit where I'm going to preview all of my content, is so tiny is because my screen is very small for my demonstration. So first thing we can do is widen that a bit and then that looks a whole lot better, doesn't it? Right. So interface wise, what have you got? Well, you have from the top down, you have a menu bar across the top here with options on it. I must admit these options in the top left corner hardly ever touch them, but they are actually there and they're quite useful if that's what you need. This will take you forwards and backwards. So it's like navigation in a browser. It will take you forwards and backwards. Then you've got the option to reveal recent files or folders. So if I click on the drop down, you can see all the things that I've looked at recently. You can also see any files that you've opened up in Photoshop. So Bridge is very integrated with the Creative Cloud, but you can quite happily use it independently of the Creative Cloud applications. Uh, then you've got so get photos from camera. Then you've got refine. So uh, this is where you start working with your images. The most important thing is this bit up here in the middle. And I'm going to come back to that because it won't make any sense at the moment. But let's take a tour of the rest of it. You have the breadcrumb trail, which is incredibly useful because the whole thing is live. So at the minute it's pointing to desktop. Uh, and I, but I can actually use that to navigate backwards. And then I can use this back button to go back to where I've actually been before. So this is actually alive and very useful for it. Now, this is the essentials view that I'm showing you. These buttons, like I said, were incredibly important. They totally change the interface. So the interface is made up of panels, starting with the favorites panel. Behind that, we have the folders panel. And that would enable you to navigate everything on your computer down to every drive. So I have an eight terabyte external drive under backup and I've got Google Drive attached. I have an S3 attached. MacBytes FM is another S3 mount point. And I've got a disk that's called Scratch Disk, which is my Scratch Disk. And then there's the Macintosh HD where everything lives. So that's what you'll get in the folders side. Now, if you want to work particularly with one particular folder. So let's say in here I wanted to work with uh, one of these. Then I could make a favorite of either the folder or a file. So I can do that in one of two ways. These are my favorites. If I wanted to favorite this archive, I can right click on it and say add to favorites. And that is one option. If I wanted the resources, I can drag that and put that over here and I can even place it. I don't want to place it inside one of the others. I want the solid blue bar. So if I wanted that above archive, I would drag and drop it there. I'm not moving anything. I'm just making it a favorite so I can quickly get to it. You can also right click and remove from favorites or reveal it in the finder if you want to see it in the finder. So folders and favorites. Then beneath that, you have three more panels. It starts with filter. Then you've got collections and you can see I do have some collections in here and you have an export panel. The big area in the middle is your content. So this is where you can navigate up and down folders, as you can see. If you're in a particular folder, so let's look at my assets for after hours. Those are files I was actually working with. Uh, they go into the presentation. So they actually have a space of their own, a folder of their own. And then the content window will allow you to see that. 
Content window will also allow you to change the view. So if you wanted them much bigger, you could do that. If you wanted to see more without having to scroll, you can make them smaller. Just by sliding the slider at the bottom or using the plus, oh, we're taking it up a little bit too much there, haven't we? Uh, plus to increase it, minus to make it smaller. Right, you have other view options in here as well. So you have this option where you can lock the thumbnail grid, which puts like a border around it, and you've actually locked that. You've got this standard view, which was the view we were using. You then have a more detailed view. So you get a thumbnail, but you also have quite a lot of information about the actual image itself. Does that matter? Well, if you select an image, your metadata panel will give you all of that information and much, much, much more besides. So maybe not. It depends whether you need to work where you see multiple elements of metadata for multiple files at the same time. Right, you also have an option here, uh, if you go back to that one there, to have thumbnails only, which means you don't see any meta in that content window. Right, over on the right hand side, and remember, this is the essentials view we're looking at. It's the default. We have a preview, which is giving you a preview of the selected image. In this view, that's pretty redundant. As you change your selection, it changes what's in the preview. So you might think totally useless. But if this, you've seen we can change the size of this. If we moved it like that, then these become a, a smaller thumbnail and this becomes a reasonable sized preview. So it's not completely useless and you can hide any of the ones that you don't want. It's just that by default, the preview window is showing. Behind that, you have the publish window, which I'm going to come back to. But these are the windows that are open by default. We've seen the meta and the other element is the keywords. And they look very strange. I will explain <laughs> why they've got very strange names on them. Right. At the bottom, you have uh, this. This is attached to the content window. So the last thing at the bottom here we've already gone through. You do have on panels some options at the bottom and the options depend on the actual panel. So on the export panel, you've got three options on the key on the metadata. You have two options, obviously, to reject it or accept it as you make changes. Right. The last bit that we've not looked at is this bit up here. Uh, and again, these are things that are global. So the ones at the top tend to be global. Uh, and this is the ability to view. Uh, you can see it. Um, you can browse quickly by looking at the embedded images. You have the option to choose a preview size. Now, all of this is to make it run faster, which again, I will look at shortly. You also have up here the ability to filter. So imagine that you've got 3000 images in this window. You could filter by date, by keyword, by a lot of options. OK, oh, we have a question. Uh, is Bridge only available on the Mac or iOS as well? Bridge is available on the Mac and Windows, but there isn't a version of Bridge for iOS. It wouldn't really make sense. Having said that, there is a Lightroom thing, isn't there? But Bridge would make less sense on iOS because of the, the lockdown nature of iOS. It's unlikely on iOS you would be having local files that were multiple different file types that were unsupported for editing on iOS. So that's why there's probably not an iOS version of it. But if you wanted to edit images or manage images on iOS, then that's where Lightroom would come in. Right. So uh, you can sort, you can sort your images. That's another way of doing it. So you can sort by any type of the metadata. So by file type, types, date created, all kinds of stuff. The one I love and really appreciate is manually. And that means that I can drag and drop images so they are in an order that I prefer. Why does that matter? Well, it does, honestly. Um, do I have a collection that I could show you? Um, not particularly posters. Mm. No, but I will make one so I can. Where I use that extensively is where I've got chapter markers for Macbytes that don't make any sense 
alphabetically. I want them in show in the order that we do them in the show. And the only way to do that is to drag them manually. So I personally love the ability to sort things manually, but a lot of people never use that option. Then you've got this option here, which is, the again, the recent files that you have had open. Then you've got the ability to create a new folder. So wherever you are in your content window or within your favorites over here, whatever you've clicked on, you can create a new folder and you have the ability to delete things. You've also got the option in the very top right hand corner to search bridge. So look for a particular image within there. Right now, that's the essentials view. I don't use that. I have my own view. That's why there is EKG custom, which is my initials and the word custom. So if I click that, that was the view I was working in. Now that looks hideous, I'll grant you. But the reason it looks bad is because it wasn't at full screen. It was hanging off the screen. Right. I was working in that view. Now, how did I get to that view? Because it's quite similar to the essentials. Apart from the filter collections and export are hidden down the bottom. How do you do that? Well, any of the panels, absolutely any of them, if you were to double click on them, uh, what are you doing now? Oh, you're opening, but, but you're not opening properly. Probably the screen resolution I've got an issue with. Uh, Shall we try it up there? It's not particularly playing ball with me because of the screen resolution. But what would normally happen is that that would pop up uh, and you would then see those as well. So what I did was I double clicked on them to close them down. And you're just going to have to trust me that if my Mac was set to full resolution, they'd pop up. <laughs> but they're not doing that at this resolution. Um, I think other than that, I didn't make that many changes to it. So you might think, well, why did you bother? I bothered because if I'm demoing it, you need to see what it looks like on your desktop. And that, when you initially install it, will be that view. I just tweak it ever so slightly and have it as my own view. The other view that I have, there is another custom one that I have. We'll come back to when we looked at the others. But you have um, a view that's built in for libraries. So what this is doing is taking you to a completely different view where the metadata that was previously on the right has zoomed over to the left. We've got folders, but we don't have favorites. Favorites aren't showing at all. There is a preview area and then down at the bottom is the content. So we can click on here and the preview that was previously in the top right is now center stage. And we can see a lot of metadata in a table view in the middle. So these are just views. All they are is a saved placement of panels and then it's given a name. Now it's given a name to give you some kind of idea of what they do. So essentials is where you might just jump in and have a look at it. Libraries were where you're working with a lot of images. You also have a film strip view, which gives you a very tiny thumbnail at the bottom and a much bigger preview area. And then over on the left, you've got your favorites back and the folders. And you've also got the filter collections and export here. So all of those. Notice it did actually zoom down. It's working. It just wasn't working in my view. There we go. So you can double click to fold those out of the way and then bring them back. Same with the favorites. If you're in the right place and, and you particularly want to make a convoluted filter, then you can close the favorites up so you can see more of the filter area. And then when you want to bring your favorites back, double click. You want to put that down at the bottom, you double click. So that is the film strip view. So I'll leave that as it was. There is an output view which is where you create things like um, PDF presentations. You can create contact sheets. So we will look at the output view. And in addition to those, you have a metadata view, which is not focusing on the image itself. It's focusing on the meta of the image. And they, that, that one only has four panels open. So you've got your favorites, you've got the metadata, you've got the ability to filter, and you've got the content and that's it. So these are just saved settings. There is a view where it is a good view to keyword in. You also have a preview view, which gives you a huge preview. And you have a light table view. So if you particularly want to work in that view, think of it like PowerPoint. 
Whoever in PowerPoint works in slide sort of view, because that looks a little bit like that. Do you ever work in slide sort of view? I don't work in slide sort of view. But I have do use slide sort of view only to drag things around. That's exactly how I use slide sort of view. <laughs> It's great for dragging things around because in the normal view, it doesn't work. But that's the point. You know, horses for courses. If you're organising images, then you might want to use slide sort of view. Uh, or in this case, light table view. And then you've got folders and folders. Let me just make sure that's full screen. Folders focuses on your favourites and your folders, but it separates them. So these two up to now in every other view have been next to each other and you have to view one or the other. But by separating them out, you can see both panels at the same time and then you have this huge preview. Now, there's one view that used to be in Bridge and I loved it. It was quite positively perfect and they took it away. I have no idea why. It used to be called Mini Bridge. And the idea of Mini Bridge was that you could have Bridge very tiny, focusing in on some thumbnails, and you could use that to drag and drop the images to other locations. Well, that was perfect for me and my presentations. So if we think what we've got here, let's go to my custom view. Right, and we'll make that a bit smaller. Right, what we've got here is some images that I would put in a presentation for After Hours 122. And indeed I did. These are all the images that I used. Uh, lots of JPEGs, but I also have some high efficiency images. I've got a PDF up there. I've got a, I've got a movie. That, that's a movie of Lola's new boyfriend. Isn't he lovely? Uh, what else have I got? Uh, more PDFs. So these are all the images. And I would have PowerPoint open and particularly on a single screen setup, which mine is not, I would want to see Bridge and be able to drag and drop out of Bridge. And Bridge had this mini view. It was brilliant. It turned it into a mini window and there was a pin to keep it stuck to the top. Um, it worked great and they took it away. So what I did was I recreated this view and called it mini Bridge. And I that jumped to the other screen, but that's what that's what it looks like. It remembers the size of the window. And in my case, I wanted to see three images across and that's it. Now, it's almost mini bridge, almost mini bridge. The, the difference is there's no button to keep it on top, which would make it perfect. But where this normally lives, I have a three monitor setup on my right hand side. I have the stuff I use, I use the least frequently. So at the moment, that's got all of the broadcast stuff on it, because once I've pressed go, that's it. I don't really need to see it again unless we've got a major calamity. Uh, and my microphone's on the left hand side, so I tend to face the left hand side. On the left hand screen, this would be situated, if we imagine the screen you're looking at is my left hand screen, that would sit there right next to my centre screen so I can drag and drop from here to wherever I want. So if we use this as an example, Lola typing, you can actually drag that out and put it on the desktop. Now, obviously here I've, I'm, I'm, these folders are on Dropbox so I can share them and dragging out of here actually drags the image out. But if I'm dragging into another application like PowerPoint, it doesn't. So I'm going to put that back in there. Now, that shows us something interesting. And to see the something interesting, I'm going to go back uh, into a full screen view here. Now, you'll notice that once this is really tiny like this and it's scooted up to the side, uh, I would appear to have lost the ability to use another view because they're not listed anymore. But you can go to view and in there. No, hang on. Where's, where's our views here? Uh, Workspace, there we go. Window workspace and all of the workspaces that you've got are available. So I can just go back to it from there. Right. So uh, one of the main differences between Bridge and Lightroom is that Lightroom uses a catalog system and Bridge does not. That means that the what you're seeing on the screen was not imported into Bridge. 
it's actually on the file system. So this folder after hours 122 is actually a folder in the finder. There it is. So how I work this every week is I have an after hours folder and within that I have two other folders, one for the data that I'm going to use and one for the assets. And it's the assets window that we're looking at. So everything that we have in there is precisely what we're looking at in Bridge. Bridge is not a catalogue that you import and then manage away from the file system. Bridge is just a window onto your file system. So, for instance, here we have this image of Lola, which is hideously named, isn't it? It's the only one we've got with that. It's hideously named. Right. That's the name of it. If we look on here, there it is. That's the same image. I'd like to rename that. So that is Walton Park Station. So Walton Park Station. Right. That moves it in here because it's all organized by file name. But when we look at the finder, it's automatically renamed it in there. Now, it needed a capital P and it didn't get a capital P, did it? So if I change that in the finder to a capital P, that will automatically update in here eventually, she said. <clears throat> Go on. Don't prove me wrong now. Uh, should, should we click away and click back? How about that? Will, will that make you happier? There we go. So it does automatically update. So you're using this as a window to your file system. Right. I can see a question. Let me have a look. So where does bridge differ from Finder? Or is that a dumb question? No, it's not a dumb question. If you think what Finder can do, let's have a look at Finder. Right. Those are the images. Which is which? Not a clue. Uh, what date was it taken? Don't know. You can, of course, bring up the meta information. There you go. That was taken on Mike's iPhone on the 27th. Uh, and there's all the, the f-stop information, the whole thing. But not really in a usable format. You have to go find it. It doesn't show it in the finder by default. You could, of course, change to this view and then you've got your thumbnails and you can change the size of those. So if you've got like very, very... Um, limited requirements, you might get away with using Finder. But Bridge has so many more capabilities. If you're thinking of it as just, well, I just want to like look at the thumbnails of the images, then maybe you would get away with Finder. But hopefully by the end of the session, Renee, you'll be able to say to me, hmm, Bridge has got a lot more features than Finder. And it does. So bear with us while, while we get through that information. Uh, and you'll see that Bridge does far, far more than Finder ever could. Right. But the point being, it's not a catalogue. With Lightroom, you could import the images and work with them. And then the ones on your file system are the originals and your, your, all your edits are made within Lightroom. But that's not the case with Bridge. Bridge is supposed to work like that, though, because it gives you the opportunity with, to use it with other applications rather than it become this huge catalogue that you can't manoeuvre. And what I mean by that is, do you remember when Apple had uh, Aperture and you were supposed to put all your photos in Aperture? And we all did like Muppets, didn't we? And then it was mm, they're getting mighty big. I'll put them on an external drive. That's what I'll do. What you were moving was the catalogue and the catalogue contained the images. And then it got a bit big for that hard drive. And what are you going to do then? Well, I'll have to buy a bigger hard drive because you don't want to split that catalogue because then that way madness lies. Well, with Bridge, it doesn't matter where the images are. Bridge will be able to show you those images just by opening the folder that those images are in. And when I say images, also other files, as we will see shortly. So that's the interface. And we've learned quite a lot already about that, believe it or not. Right. You can create custom interface, custom workspaces if you want. So I've got two, as you've seen. Best way to do that is to make a new workspace first. So I'm going to make a new workspace and we'll call this one demo. And you get these options. Do you want to save the window location as part of the workspace? Now, I did leave the tick in that to create mini bridge. If I take the tick out of that, it will just open this, the workspace that you're about to create within the window that you already have open. 
So sometimes you might want to keep that open, sometimes maybe not. You also have the opportunity to save the sort order as part of the workspace. So that means you could have two workspaces that are identical, but one has it sorted one way and one has it sorted the other, which means you don't have to go through and manually change the sort order. You just change your workspace. Right. And then I'm going to hit save. And what we have at that point is our demo workspace at the top. So it's right there. The latest one we've used and it looks exactly the same as the previous one. That's the point you start customizing it. So if, for instance, I wanted to see the folders somewhere else, I just drag that panel somewhere else. And let's say over here where we've got the export, let's say I want the metadata over there in the same spot to be very careful dragging that. Uh, can we actually get this up a bit? There we go. So we can see it. And I want to take the keywords over there. And that will mean that I can see the folders much better. If I then decide, yeah, and I'll take the favorites over there as well, then I've got a tall view for all of the metadata on the left. And I've got that I can see all the folders and favorites on the right. And I can scoot that down and make that a little bit narrower. And then I can focus on the middle bit. And if I take those a little bit smaller, then I can see all of the images in that window. And that would then be my demo view. I could quickly go back to exactly how it was and then go back to the demo view. So workspaces, don't underestimate them. Very, very useful to do a specific job as and when required. If you want to delete your workspace, make sure you are in the workspace and there'll be a tick next to it and you have the option to delete it or reset it. Now, resetting it would reset it to how it was when the demo one was created. Here, I want to delete it, but we have the top uh, reset and we have the fourth option to reset. That will reset all of them. Now, it says reset standard workspaces and the standard workspaces are essentials, library, film strip, output, metadata, keywords, preview, light table and folders. Any that you create that it assumes quite rightly that you want to work with those straight away and they go to the top of the list. So demo, I would like to remove and I just hit remove. And with a bit of luck, it will remove it. You're lying to me, aren't you? Uh, is it asking for confirmation? Oh, it, want, it wants me to confirm. Right. I want demo to be deleted. Where you go. And that takes it away. And then I can go back to my EKG custom. Right. So we, we've done the custom workspaces. We're now going to move into one of the reasons that makes Bridge better than Finder, which is managing the metadata in it. So if we look at the files that we've got here, uh, let's pick this one. Lola was disgusted. Somebody put a railway in her part. Right. We do have metadata in the metadata panel and it's sectioned off into individual sections. So let's fold it all up. These are the sections that you have. The very top, you have the visual display akin to a camera. So that's one thing the finder can't do. Underneath that, you then have the file properties. So it has a name. It has a document type. This one is a raw image from a phone. Uh, it tells you the date it was created. It's got the size. Now, some of this information is also available in the panel above. But this is giving you all of the information in a quick list. Then you've got your IPTC core information. Now, at the moment, there is not information in there. But actually, you know, Mike could put Mike's phone number in as the copyright holder and an email address and a website. And you could put all of that in there. So in the creator, it was Mike that created that. So we'll put that in. Oh, what job title should we give him? How about photographer? <laughs> Oh, let's elevate him. Uh, then you could put the address in. So that would be sale. Uh, our city. We don't really have a city. Uh, we're, we're in a county. We're in Cheshire. Um, we could put the postcode in. We're in M33. Country. So UK and so forth. So we could put anything in here. Then it goes beyond information that is kind of descriptive and it heads off into what the headline for this image would be, what the description would be, what keywords you want for it and all the rest of it. So there's 
ACUS of data in there, ACUS. So that says copyright status unknown. So we'll say it might's copyrighted that one. Maybe I should have put Lola in. Then you've got an extension to the IPTC data, which is, is there a person shown, the location it was created? And you can fill all of this in. Um, particularly useful is model information. And remember that anything that you put in here becomes searchable and you can use it in a filter. Then you've got the camera data, which is the X if data. So all of that, the fact it was an iPhone 11 and the flash didn't go off and then what the metering mode was and all the rest of that. Lens make, Apple, make of the phone. You've got GPS information, which didn't look like it captured. Did you take that off there, Mike, or something? Not to his knowledge, apparently. Uh, but you can put that in. So uh, we would put in the latitude, longitude and altitude, if you like, for Walton Park. Then you've got data, metadata that is specific to audio. We do have some data in here that will have some uh, audio information and you've got video information. Love that tape name. <laughs> That's going back, isn't it? And then you've got the, the last information in here. So. That's all of the metadata that is accessible in here. However, you also have keywords. Yes, I will apply the changes to that. These are your keywords. Now, why these look rather strange is that I have imported and worked with today some images. And these are the keywords that came with them. So you can see animal, dog, pet, puppy. Oh, yes, they're, they're, they're dogs. Uh, there were some Eskimo dogs, hence that breed, pedigree, the fact it was sunny. These are all the kind of information that came with it when I opened these images. So the fact that they're in here, that's where those keywords have actually come from. Uh, or we could say here, couldn't we, that um, Iggy um, is angry. And that's that's it's as simple as that to apply a keyword. Iggy's now angry. Um, I don't think in here, but let's let's have a look. You never know. You never know. EQRS. Mm -mm -mm. Samoid. And he's a Samoid as well. The reason that keyword is there is because some of the pictures that I imported and I can go to this one of Lola and she's also a Samoid. And although Mike isn't a Samoid, Lola's in those two pictures. And it's that simple to add some meta to it. She's in that one as well, isn't she? And there she is. Um, the reason that that is there is that some of the images had Samoids in them. They also had Huskies in. So I think if we go up a bit, we'll probably find that Huskies in there. Don't make a liar out of me unless you've got it under Siberian. Nope, there we go. Husky. So they're, they're available. Once you've got those keywords in there, you can then apply them to other images, which again, very, very quick, easy to do. So you can change the meta and you can add keywords. But that's a long way round of doing it because there are other ways to do this. Right. Um, I'm going to show you a folder that's got in it some uh, be in the bridge folder. There we go. There's the dogs. Those are the dogs that I imported. So there are Samoids in there. And there are Huskies in there. There's a Sammy. There's another Sammy. Oh, isn't she pretty? But you know what's weird about that? That doesn't look like a Samoid puppy. The ears are wrong. <laughs> but there you go. I happen to know that. Now, how I took that full screen so you could see it is I press the space bar and then you get a completely interface free preview of your images. Uh, there's the grinning dog. He looks so cute. So these are the ones that I brought in and that's where all of the meta came from. Now, you can also see as it came in, some of these have got like a one star and a white label. What's all this about? Where did these come from? Well, they came because these were imported images from other people and they had written this information back to the metadata in here and that had been pulled through to here. And Lola really does have that. That's her eating mat. Well, it's not her eating mat. I found it on the Internet, but that's what her eating mat says. <laughs> Right, so there's the dogs. Let's go back to bridge. And I also have in here multiple file types. Right, this proves the point that unlike Lightroom, where it has a limited range of file types that it can read, what we've got here is the first one is an InDesign magazine. And there you can do a preview of it. Then I've got an EPS. 
I've got another EPS uh, with transparency for Christmas. Then I've got an InDesign markup file, another InDesign file. I've got a video here. This one is um, a video I did many moons ago. You're going to let me preview you. Um, as I'm hovering over it, you can see it is a video. That was a promotional video, I think, but very short. But there you go. I've got another EPS here. That one's got transparency on it. Another InDesign file. I've got one of my own InDesign files, which is an information sheet. And these might look like images, but they're not. These are audio. These are MP3s. So every week for our radio station, or well, one of our radio stations, we do some segues between the shows. So the shows are keyed up, ready to play. And then at 12 o'clock, that one plays. One o'clock, the next one plays. Two o'clock, the next one, and so forth. These are MP3s. So if I click on the three o'clock MP3, we can see in here. So let's fold these up again. And down the bottom, we have audio information. Who is the artist? That would be me. What's the album? Brooklyn's 196. So that metadata is actually locked inside the MP3 file. And yet Bridge can read it. Again, that's something that Finder by default. No, it doesn't do stuff like that. Also, without opening these files, the video and the audio, what's happening up here is it's actually previewing it. Now, if I get it so you can hear that, you're going to have to trust me because then we'll get feedback and it'll be all screechy. But if I want to hear it without actually opening it, I just press play and it plays the entire file in the window. And then I can say, no, that, that's not the one I'm looking for. So multiple file types, multiple file types. Now, uh, next thing we might want to do with something, let's say we're trying to organize ourselves. So we think to ourselves like with the dog ones. So let's go to the dog ones. Uh, it'd be much better. All of these have got descriptive names, but might not be what I want because I might want to work differently with them entirely. Uh, I might want to use these for projects. I might want to check whether I want to use these. So. What I'm thinking with these is, all right, I, I might want to rename these. Right. Let's say I grab hold of all of them, right? Because obviously I can rename them individually by just clicking, click once on there and you can type away to your heart's content. There is a shortcut for that as well, which is not easy on a Mac. Uh, it's F2. So once I, I just go into edit mode, I don't Oh, I always go into edit mode, but sometimes it, it doesn't go into edit mode uh, and you need to press the F2 key, which is function F2 on a Mac keyboard. But you can you can edit the title by just clicking and then changing it. But obviously we've got lots of these images. So one option that you have in here is to batch rename them. So up here it is in batch rename. So tools batch rename. And that brings up this window now. This is amazingly powerful. It might not look it, but it is. Trust me, it, it, it's huge. This let's say that I'm in the mode that I'm thinking, let's name these files like dog one, dog two, or maybe we want the date that they were taken or something like that. Right. You have presets. First of all, there is this default one that says modified. And then there's whatever was last used and you have what's called string substitution. I'm just going to use the default one. And what I'm going to do is actually create a definition for renaming all of these files. So what's the new file name going to be? And you get to choose what type of data you're about to specify. So I want some text at the beginning of it. So let's say with this one, I want to say demo dogs. Right. So that's what I want at the beginning. And I probably want that then to have like an underscore. And then I want some other information, but there's nowhere to put it, is there? But there is if you add another step to it on the right. So you are building this up in blocks. And the first thing is you're saying lose the name that's there and start the file name with demo dogs. And then in here, you could then add back the current file name, which is very clever. You could choose a sequence number. You could add a sequence letter. You could have a date and time or something from the metadata. So let's choose the metadata and choose something from it. And these are the options you get from the metadata. 
Now, some of them are going to be blank. If you remember the title and the headline, I think most of them were blank. So be very careful when you try and do that. Some of them won't have that information. But we'll stick the aperture value down and hope for the best that we do get some information. Right, let's go and add a third option. So at the moment it's demo dogs and then the aperture value and then something else. Right, let's say at that point we want to put a sequence number in. You get to say in this middle dialogue, what is the starting number? And then over on this side, you get to say how many digits you want that sequence number to be. So it could just be one digit and then it will just keep counting up. Three digits is pretty safe. That gives you 999 um, numbers before you're going to run out. And we don't have 999 files. Uh, for Mac bytes, we do four. So let's go for four, starting at one. Right. Should we add anything else onto it? What else have we got in here? Uh, we could put even put the folder number, the folder name in. I reckon we'll just stick a sequence letter on the end. You know, just do that and be done. Now, at this point, it gives you a preview at the bottom. I am coming back to options, but at the bottom, it tells you 29 files will be processed. That'll be interesting with a sequence letter. And the current file name would be there it is. And then the new file name would be demo dogs F8. And then there's a full stop. And then we have our four padded numbers and our one and then an A. So that's the preview for one file. And it's the first file it's showing us. But up here we have a preview button and this will show us the lot. So we can actually look through these. Looking at it, it would make more sense to have the number after the word demo dogs, wouldn't it? That would make much more sense. Having seen the list, not going to sort well. So let's come out of that and say, no, uh, what we want, we'll, lo we'll lose the aperture. We'll leave it like that. So I've changed that in there. Now we can go back into the preview. That looks much better. And we can go all the way down. And you can see once it gets to Z, A, 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 B, A, C. Oh, it's like Excel. Amazing. Now, talking of Excel, you can export this information to a comma separated text file if you want to at this stage. So click on CSV export. We will put that on the desktop as a rename. And click save. OK on that. And then on the desktop, there's the file. Tell me we can preview it. Excellent. We have the previous name and we have the new name. So it might be an idea to keep that to hand. Now, back in here. There's always that nagging doubt at the back of your mind that you might want to undo all of this. And Bridge lets you do that because in the options, there is an option to preserve the current file name in the XMP metadata. So we'll put a tick in that box. You can also force file name compatibility with Windows and Unix if you need to. That's because the Mac supports certain characters in a file name that Windows does not. So if you need to force it, then all you need to do is to put a tick in the box. Right, we're ready to rename them then. So hit rename and it's done. Simple as that. Each one now has the new file name. And then you realise that the backup copies that you have, you don't have them. And now you can't remember what was called what. And it's got you covered with that as well because we preserved the file name. So let's go back into batch rename. And this time we don't want to do all of this. Let's get rid of these. And in here, choose preserved file name. So there is in the file a preserved file name. And it's the name that we want, but you could put the name and the extension, the extension or just a number. But no, we'll preserve. We want the preserved file name and you can change it to be uppercase or lowercase if you want. Leaving it at an original case. If it was uppercase, it will be. If it was camel case, it will be camel case. It will be totally the original file name, which you can see at the bottom. So our demo dogs 0001A, this was the original file name. 
and the beginning of the file name with the description was lowercase and at the end there were some uppercase letters in it. So it's going to revert it to exactly what it was before. And it wouldn't matter. I mean, obviously, this is within seconds of me doing this, but it wouldn't actually matter if this was two years later. As long as that file name is still in the metadata, you can undo the rename from two or three years ago. Right. If you hit the preview, it will give you the preview. So it's going the other way than the way it went before. Again, you can save that out to CSV if you want and then just hit rename to rename it. And we're back to where we started. So, again, this is the kind of thing that there aren't many other applications that give you this kind of um, flexibility in terms of managing assets. But that's what a good digital asset manager should do. Right. So far, we've looked at manipulating all of the images or an individual image. But what if we're looking for the perfect image? So we think that one's kind of cute and that one's not bad. So you start looking through and what I'm doing is I'm holding down the command key and I'm clicking on random images. And what's happening is up here in the preview, it's showing me all the images that I have got selected. So I'm going to choose a lot of these Sammy pictures. Oh, he's rather cute. And oh, and, and Wolfie, that one looks good. Oh, and that's got such a smile on its face. Right. At this point, I've got 10 image is selected. And what I really need to do is like have a closer look at them and see which ones would work best. Right. You have a special view for this. So uh, let me find that special view. I never use the menu bar, but I will go and find that. Uh, I need to use review mode. So view review mode. This is review mode. It shows you all of the images in a carousel. Isn't he cute? <laughs> Lola lies upside down like that and usually sneezes. But what we have here is all of the images that we selected and you can carousel between them. So the first way to do that is to use your mouse pointer, which is on the other screen, but it's coming in. There we go. You can go backwards. You can go forwards. So like that. But you can also use the arrow keys. So right arrow key goes to the right, left arrow key goes backwards. Now, let's say as I'm working through this, that's cute, but it's not going to work because we need a close up image and that one's not going to work. But at the moment, it's part of the selection. But if you use the down arrow key, you'll drop it, not delete it, just drop it from this review and the selection you currently have. Now, remember, we had 10. I'm going to drop it. We've now got nine. Simple as. So let's go through them. Which ones do we definitely not want? These are lovely, but they're not going to work because we need a close up. So we don't want that one either. So now we're down to seven. Uh, I think he's looking away from the camera, so we don't really want that either. And that's kind of cute, but some people would be freaked out by that. So we best drop him as well. Uh, don't think we need just the foot. So we'll lose that one. And that leaves us with four that we're going to pick from. Uh, and I think if, we, if we're trying to entice people, you know, to, to, to think this dog's kind of cute. You're probably looking at the mummy and the baby Sammy uh, or maybe maybe the one that's smiling because the wolf will freak certain people out. But in essence, I've got four pictures that I'm left with. And those are the ones that are maybe my pick or there's something that I want somebody else to see. And I would use review mode to mark those like that. If I press escape, it will come out of review mode and you also have the cross in the top right hand corner. But the beauty of it is, if you look at the preview on the right, where we had 10 images selected, we don't have 10, 10 images selected anymore. We actually have the four images that were left after our review, which is great because they're all together. That means we could right click and put them in a folder or we could mark them in some kind of way. We could do things with them because they are selected like that. I'm just going to go back into review mode with those four images because down at the bottom, we also had options here to zoom. So it zoomed in and I can actually move that around and I can get a loop on it to see is that bang in focus? Is, is that going to work? And that's gorgeous. Yes, that one would work. And I could click in here and I can do the same. And you see, you can even do a comparison because it's per image. So if I'm checking the eye on that one, move that. Oh, look at that. Got rain on his nose. There we go. 
So you can do all of that on each individual image. Right, so far so good with that. Right, to close those, there is a cross to close each one. So I'm going to close them all down. Can you make a contact sheet from those four images? Yes, you can, Renee. Yes. Right, to facilitate that, at the bottom, we've got a couple of buttons that we've not looked at. And one of them is this button, which looks like a little folder with a plus on it. And that is indeed what it is. So those four images are my possibles. I want the client to choose from those four for the cover for the magazine. And I can tell you straight off the one in the top right hand corner would, would work fabulously well with a masthead on a magazine. In fact, I'm pretty sure Dogs Trust have used that one, don't you think, Mike? Looks familiar to me. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a new collection. And a collection is a saved grouping of images. So let's say this is a pick for cover. Good grief, pick's got a K for cover and save. Right, that now says content and it's got my four images. Where, just a minute, where did the rest go? Right, down here you have collections. So let's bring that up and have a look. Right, I had some over here, right? Show art on Google Drive and show art. Uh, this would need to read it in. I'll explain what's going on there. But this is a collection that we have made and we can quickly get back to it. And once we've got that ability, we can then use this as the source for a contact sheet or anything else either. So, yes, we could. Now, what are collections then? Collections I'm going to look at when we've looked at filtering. So for the moment, I'm going to go back to the folders that we had. In fact, I had a favourite, didn't I, for it? I did. There's my data and there's the dogs. So this is all the dogs. The thing to think about with this collection before I explain how we're going to use them effectively is it does not move the images. That's the exception to the fact that Bridge looks at the finder as the source for the images. Collections are the exception to that. They are virtual and they only exist within Bridge. Now, I'm going to link collections with the ability to find and search and filter images. OK, so we have the ability here. We're looking at a folder full of images, right? Some of them actually say Husky in them. Some of them might say Sammy, but some definitely, definitely we've got Spitz and Huskies. Right. So up here, we have the ability to apply a filter or clear a filter or show whatever we want. So I'm going to do a search in the current folder. So I'm filtering the current folder based on the fact that there is Husky in the name. So if you look at the top, we've got find criteria, find Husky in 01 dogs. That's the folder and all the subfolders with bridge search. And that's what we've got. All of these say Husky. Now, that's not a at a 100% effective way to search unless you named the files and then it is. But I didn't name these files and it could well be that there are other images that have Huskies in them, but it just doesn't have the name Husky in the file name. And I've said search the file name. But of course, we did have those keywords, didn't we? And the Husky was an option. So you could search a keyword, but we've actually just searched up here. And it's giving you that criteria and letting you look at it. Now, if you know that you've got a folder full of 3000 dog images and there is a special edition of your dog magazine coming out all about Huskies, then it would be probable that within the next month you're going to go back and be looking at pictures of Huskies from your dog folder until your eyes bleed, in which case it would be very handy to save those as a collection. And that's where collections come in. All a collection is, is a saved group of images. And there's a couple of ways that you can do that. So we've got the search applied down here, which is in your collections. You have the ability to make a new collection. There's your new collection. And we could say that that is Huskies, but obviously that didn't add the Huskies to it. We would have to add the Huskies to it. 
So to do that, we would go to our data, we would find the dogs, we would make sure that we had filtered for Husky, and we would grab all of those images and drag and drop them into the Husky collection. And there's 13 of them. That does not move them, which is good news. Because if we had Folder 02 dogs, and they also had Huskies in, in fact, let's go do that. Let's go get some Huskies. So I will, um, I will not do that. I will do that. Oh God, where have you gone? Right, let's do that. I'm going to search Envato Elements for Husky and go and find some new Husky images. So let's get that out of the way. And here is a rather alarmingly large. Yeah, we didn't have him, did we? No, and we didn't have that one. Oh, just look at them. There's videos as well. I, I may lose myself for an hour or so. OK, let's have that one as well. So I need to download these images and put them in the folder to dogs. So I'm going to download these, which all I need to do is that. Hopefully. Come on. Add and download. And finally, download that one. Right. They are at the moment in my downloads folder and I definitely don't want them there. I don't want to work with them from there either, because at some point I'm going to move them and then they're going to get lost. So what I'm going to do is I will get the downloads folder uh, on one screen. So there's my downloads folder with the new three images. But I'll show you how I would get these into Bridge. So in my Bridge setup here, I'm going to create a new folder. O2 Husky Dogs and drag and drop those images in there. OK, that has moved them from the downloads folder. It has physically located them in Dropbox projects, Adobe Bridge Demo, Husky Dogs. But I would like these to return or belong to the Husky collection over here. And that's simple as well. I'll just drag and drop them. But that doesn't move them. That's virtual. So my Husky collection now has 16 dogs in it from two folders. So that's when you would use a collection. So what we're looking at here with the MapBytes ones is the fact that when I say show art from or posters, any of these, uh, 1,280 1, PNG, it is pulling the show art from 135 folders and it's returning one image from each one. So I don't have to consolidate them and move them on the hard drive. I would use a collection. Now, let's say with this that we have yet another folder. So we're going to need more Huskies, aren't we? You can never have too many Huskies, I find. Right. Uh, more Huskies. So back we go again to more Huskies. I'm going to create another one here. So we can get rid of the three of those, but we'll go back over here, which was the index. And we'll find that one and we'll take him as well. And that one, I think. So we've got more Huskies. So I'm going to download those again. These will be in the download folder, but they will not be included in my collection, nor will they be included in my collection full stop unless uh, we already, we've already got that one. All right, off you toddle. They won't be in that collection at all unless I manually put them there. So they're in the downloads folder. I know exactly where they are. I'm going to put them somewhere else, but the somewhere else I'm going to put them is in the folder. So let's get our demo folder. We'll put them in the Huskies. We'll put them there. OK, so let me get my downloads folder downloads. And there are three more Huskies. Brilliant. Oh, I've already got one, have I? Well, we'll skip that one. Uh, have I got the wrong one? Never mind, I've added one. The other two don't appear to have downloaded, but never mind, I've added one. So one of these images is not actually in here. Uh, so we've got that one with um, we've got that one. We are missing one, though. So Use the back. We are missing one, which is probably going to be that one, I think. Uh, can I tell from here? Crying out loud. Uh, got that one. Yes, he's in there. And we've got that one. So, yeah, I think it's that one or that one. And I definitely downloaded that one first. So it must be this one. OK, 
Now, the problem with, with what's happening is I'm downloading images or I'm getting images from clients or, or somewhere else. And they're all appearing in different folders. And I've no idea what's happening here. Are they in my collection? Or are they not in my collection? This is part of the problem. So you have another option here. And this is if you look at them, they've got slightly different icons on them. So I'm going to click this one. And this is a different type of collection. This is a smart collection. Now, it will actually make more sense if we look in a different folder. If we look in the first one in our dogs folder and we have I'm going to not do a husky one. I'm going to do a spitz one. Yeah. Right. So I'm going to make a smart collection. So it's going to look in the dogs folder. You could choose any of the folders. You could browse for a folder. It doesn't matter. But you choose a folder. Then you specify some criteria. Now, the criteria that we're looking at are the criteria that I use to create the MacBytes Show Art Smart Collection, uh, which isn't relevant here. But I do want to make the criteria contain, and this time it's the word spits. Uh, I don't need anything else, so it doesn't particularly need to be a PN, uh, PNG. I could make that a JPEG if all the images that I would want to use for the magazine were a JPEG. But sometimes I might have a video and think, oh, that would work for the story when it's posted online. So I don't particularly need anything else at the moment. I just want a smart collection for where the file name contains spits. Then you've got what happens down here. If all criteria are met, so I want you to match it if all the criteria are met or if any of the criteria are met. Now, what's the difference with that? Well, I could add here where the file name contains and put Samoid. But if I say all the criteria, it's highly unlikely you're going to have a file name that contains both because some of these are mislabeled as spits when they're Samoids and some just have Samoids, some just have spits. So. You could change that and say if any of the criteria are met, which is in essence saying if the file name contains spits or the file name contains Samoid, then I want you to match it. Do you want to include the subfolders and do you want to include non-indexed files? We're going to talk about what non-indexed files are, but in essence, they are files that Bridge has not yet looked at. OK, and I'm going to say yes, just just pick the whole lot. And you'll notice that the button actually says find. So we'll click on that. But what it's doing is giving me a new smart collection over on the left hand side. So I will say snow dogs. That way it covers all that, that kind of dog, doesn't it? We know that there are some in there um, that we have not found and they probably don't have that in the file name. But. The difference between a smart collection and a collection is that a smart collection stays up to date, whereas with a collection, it's manual. So to get those extra dogs in here, I had to drag and drop them from the second folder. But with a smart folder, a smart collection here, this will get updated as, full, as images are added to this, this folder. So. Let's go to the actual folder for dogs, which is this one. And oh, Edward's successfully installed Adobe Bridge. Excellent. I'm <laughs> glad to hear it. Right. Um, this one says sledding with spitz dogs, doesn't it? And well, let, let's name one of these. Where's the, where's that Sammy? Right. That one just says dogs. So if we go in there and we put that is a spitz dog. Right. And we then go back to the snow dogs. This one is then included, whereas before it wasn't. But I didn't manually add it. Now, when should you use a collection and when should you use a smart collection? Well, a smart collection is, is looking at a single folder. A collection can have them from multiple folders. But use a smart collection where you need it to automatically update. Use a collection when you want control over which images are selected. So if you think about it, a collection, you look at this and you think smart collections all the way. It's going to be automatic and indeed it is. 
But collections have their place because you might want to add images to it that don't have anything in relation in common with the other images. So let's say I find this really cute picture of a Labrador. I don't want to have to go and I just want this one picture of the Labrador adding to my collection, not every photo with Labrador in it. So collections give you the ultimate in control. Smart collections make the whole thing a little bit faster. Now, you can also in here, this isn't something I do a lot, but you can do it. So I'll show you that you can do it right in here. When you're when you have an image selected, you have the ability to rate images. So as you can see, there were some images here that had got um, color coding on them and some stars on them. Right. If you want to star your images, you can do that with command one, command two, command three, command four or command five for five stars. Command zero to take the stars away. On Windows, that is control. So control one, two, three, four, five and zero to take it away. You also have command six, seven, eight and nine. And they're changing the color. But what does the color mean? Well, if you go into your preferences in Bridge, so Adobe Bridge preferences, you will have in here your labels and ratings. This shows you the shortcuts and you can even take away the need to use a command key. If you take the tick out of that, you could just press one, two, three, four or five and you'll give your images a rating. Below that, you have your label options. So these are the colors and they are assigned to a shortcut and have a meaning. But if you wanted those meanings to be something else, then you can just click in here and type over them. So let's say that is magazine covers. So whenever you use command and six, you're thinking this is possibly a magazine cover. So you just OK it. You go onto the um, image and you command and six. That might be a good one for a cover. That might that's a perfect one for a cover. And just like that, you can go back in and then change that back to mean what it did before, which was originally select. I don't know why select red, I'd have thought green, but then that's approved. So you can have those mean anything you want. What I will say is if you're using bridge in conjunction with other people, you might need to think about that, that if you change these, you're going to have to change, tell the people that you've changed them and tell them what to and what it means to you. But that doesn't mean you need to stick to rigidly to what Adobe have put in there. It makes more sense to do something else than do something else. And all of that you can use when you're trying to find an image, when you want to filter by it. So remember, we had this filter option here and you can say, well, show me only the five stars. Oh, and nothing's got that. Uh, some had three, though. I know they did. That one had three. So let me clear the filter and go back and put the five stars on the little doggy. And there's a five star one. So put five stars in, go up here and you can filter for the five stars and we should have two. There you go. Right. OK. Any questions so far? Mm. We're all celebrating Edward's win there, aren't we? Getting that in. Right. Uh, some of the things that you can do are more automatic as well. So uh, before we get into the output, this is going to be fun with older versions. I will explain. But in here, I have got some panorama images. So uh, these ones were from my days as an Adobe user group manager. These ones were just taken with an iPhone in a shop. But in essence, what we've got there is two panoramas. Or we have the source material for two different panoramas and a folder. Now, I can see that these ones are definitely part of the same pan panorama. But are these? I'm not sure. Right. These ones definitely are. There's only three of them and they definitely are. So you have a few options when you're working with images like this so you don't get confused. Right. One option is you can grab these three images and you can say stack group as a stack. And that puts them into a little stack where they're one on top of the other. You click on the number and it expands, but you can see it's got a border around it. And that's telling you that these images are part of a bigger whole, which is a stack of those three images. You could do exactly the same with these. Just grab them 
and go to stack, group a stack, and then you can fold them up. So that's telling you when you look at this panorama folder, there's two panoramas. There's the first one with seven images and the second one with three. If you're wondering why there's a play button when they're images, well, if you click play, it will actually rotate you through the images. So let's click play on that one and it will take you through all of the images. Right, you can unstack. So you can either right click and unstack. It's in there somewhere. Ooh, where are we? Stack and ungroup from stack. Ooh, Tony says, is this just for images or would it do the same thing for PDFs? Uh, no, it wouldn't for PDFs. Uh, oh, actually, you can probably make your own stack if you wanted to. because It's manual, isn't it? I've never done it with a PDF. Um, but hang on while you see what, what this can do. And that would explain why I initially said no. You could probably manually stack them if you wanted. Oh, I need to point out as well that this is not moving them on the hard drive. This is something in Bridge that's virtual. So again, right click, stack, ungroup from stack. Right. You could have a folder full of images. There could be 30 uh, for each panorama and then there could be 30 panoramas in there. So wouldn't it be better if Bridge could sort that out for you? And we have a stack menu and we have the option to auto stack panorama images and or HDR images. Now, there are no HDR images in this folder, but if I hit auto stack, there should be two panoramas. So we'll click that and have a look at it. It actually examines the contents of each file and it stacks them. But it does not believe that that image is part of this panorama. It just doesn't. <laughs> don't know why there's enough of an overlap to me but what you can do with that is you can stack that you can put that in the stack if you want to put it in the stack so now it's seven and you've said okay I've done that last one manually because it is part of the stack so that time I didn't need to do the manual stacking uh, when you say pdfs do you mean individual pages of pdfs or multiple pdfs because if it's multiple PDFs, we do have multiple file types in here and we do have some PDFs. There's one and we definitely had at least one more. I swear we did. I could, of course, search, couldn't I, by type? Oh, I haven't got more than one PDF. Uh, tell you what, let's duplicate that one and then I have. And then I've got two PDFs. So if I go up to the stacks and I group as a stack, yes, you can. So it might make sense if you've got like outlines that you want stacked together or something like that. But yes, you can. So if it's multiple PDFs, yes, you can. If it's pages within a PDF, you'd have to expand them first. Right. So that's working fine. So let's go back to where we were with the panorama. Right. So if we go into that, we can open that by clicking on the seven at the top. And those are the seven images. Right. That one, I know that will work. Those images have been around for years, but these ones were very rough. They were literally just taken by me in a store for a friend who's crazy about trains. And if we look at some of these images, it was the Holiday Express trains. And I thought they looked, they were amazing old steam trains. So I took three pictures. What I wanted to send was a panorama of these. OK, right. So we've got some images. These are JPEGs, but I'm going to right click on that and I am going to hmm, open in camera raw, which seems counterintuitive. I know. Just keep keep the faith. You can manipulate these images in here, but I'm just leaving them alone and I'm making sure uh, that they're selected. And then what I can do up here uh, that's that's my options. What I want to do here is I'm going to no, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm going to merge them, aren't I? Come on. That's better. Uh, I'm going to merge to a panorama before I export. I will explain why the exports are tinged tricky if you don't use Creative Cloud. But first of all, I want to merge these to a panorama. So it has a think about it. And I can assure you, because I've done this a million times, these are perfect, totally perfect. That yeah, I cannot see the join. I did it on an iPad once about four years ago and you could just see the join, but you cannot see the join here. 
So what you've got here is it's asking about projection and that looks just about right to me. So I don't think I need to do anything. I certainly don't need to fill the edges because I've got no edges there. It's already been cropped off because we've got auto crop. You don't want auto crop. That is what it would look like. And then you may need to fill the edges. It would try and fill the edges. Doesn't do a bad job, actually. That's not at all bad. I could live with that. OK, so if you can have it cropped or you can do the fill edges and if it doesn't look quite right, then you've got this boundary warp to change it slightly. But that's not bad. I'm happy with that. So I'm going to merge it and that will give me a DNG, a digital negative file an Adobe digital negative file. So click OK there and it loads it into the tray at the bottom of Camera Raw. This is actually Camera Raw that we're using, which means I can say mm, not bad, but it was Christmas. So I think I can I think I can go crazy uh, with, with the color here and just bump up the color a little bit and I can probably change the exposure a little bit. That's probably uh, we don't really want to go much further than that. Let's put it like that. But you can use all of the options in here to tweak that to be exactly what you want. If I click done, it will save it. All right. It says without opening the image. That's a good idea, because if I say open, I do get an option to say open, open as an object or as a copy, but open where? And the answer to that is Photoshop, which won't do us any good if you're an Affinity user. So I'm just going to hit done. Now, the reason that this is important at this stage is if I were to try and open that, it's a DNG file, so photo should know about it. I have weirdness happening, so I'm not here to just say to you, oh, you click this and it just works fabulously. I'll give you, I'll give you where it doesn't work as well. I'm going to right click on that and say open with. The default is Photoshop, but that's because I've got it installed. But I also have Acorn and Designer and Photo and Publisher. I am on photo. Photo is lit up blue. All confirm photo is lit up blue. And when I click, I am clicking on photo. So we'll have a wait while it has a ponder and Affinity Publisher opens. It does open the image, but oh dear me, wrong on so many levels. Colour, absolutely shocking. It's now orange. It was red and it's opened up in Publisher, even though I chose designer. Um, photo. And there's no way to stop it. I've been trying for, for the last week. It won't do it. So here's what you need to do. Don't do that. Now, yours might open in photo. It might. It might open in designer. It, how it works that out is the last Affinity app to be installed. And for me, it was Publisher. OK. I see a question there, Mike. Put it in and I'll have a look later as to that question. Right. But what on earth do we do with this? Because the DNG was fine, wasn't it? It was fine. Right. Let's open the DNG in Camera Raw. So we've got one file open, one DNG. This is the panel that we created. Right. This time, instead of doing the done and the open and all the rest of it where it just didn't work, we have this option that we looked at before. This is a custom preset. We're going to save it in the same location. We're going to call it pro processed, although we could say uh, it doesn't actually matter what we call it, but we'll say processed. This time, instead of it being a digital negative, we don't want it to be a digital negative from the format. I'm going to choose Photoshop. Now, you might be thinking, well, hang on a minute. You know, I'm using Affinity. Affinity can read Photoshop files. It even knows it should open them in, in Affinity Photo. So I'm going to choose Photo. I'm going to keep all of the metadata and everything else. I'm going to resize it, scale it down or anything like that. And then I'm just going to save it. Right. That means it's no longer a raw file. Fair enough. But we didn't need to edit it anyway because we'd already processed it in here. So we've got this Photoshop file with a bit of log. If we do the open with. This time it will understand it needs to be photo. If it opens publisher, I'm, I'm going to die a death. Oh, good grief. OK, right. That's not working. But but it's not opening it in the right app. That's something to do with the Mac That's something to do with the file stuff, even though 
I have it set correctly. It's just not working right. But we are one step nearer it being right because this over on this side is bright red. So at least the colour's right this time. So let's quit that. So if I right click and I open with, it's not going to work. It's just doing its own thing. I don't know why. I really don't. One option I've got, if you are an Affinity user, is to go into the preferences and you can actually decide what opens with what. You have all of these file types and you can say, I want you to open this file with this application. So if we had Photoshop file in there, where are we? Is it in there? Mm, got PDF. So that's opening correctly because I set most of these, set them myself. But I don't see that one. I don't see a PDF. It could be in there. Uh, PSD. I don't see it. But if it was there, then you could change it. You know, if you wanted your bitmaps opening with Affinity, you could do that. The other way to do it, of course, is to right click on it, reveal it in the finder, which means I get a window over here. Where's it put it? That's not the window. Oh, here it is. Right. Other, other monitor. There we go. There is the PSD and it's selected. And from within there, although Photoshop's the default, maybe this will work. There we go. Affinity Photo. And you have the, the correct colour in the correct app. So it's not quite as seamless as it is with Creative Cloud apps, but you can get there in the end, both in terms of the colour of it and the fact that Bridge seems to think that Publisher is Photo. I'm not quite sure why, but it does. Right. What have we got left to cover? Uh, 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 so we've done the stacking. We've done the panorama. Um, I will show you swiftly in the project. No, I won't show you in the projects. Will I? I will show you in Bridge. There's Bridge. Uh, you can do exactly the same with high, high dynamic range images. So there's a whole range of them in here. Um, I'll put the link in uh, from where you can download these. Remind me, Mike, at the end, make a note. Um, they are, each one has three. Each high dynamic range image has three images, uh, except the one that's got four, which is this one here. And again, what you can do is go to Stacks, Auto Stack. It'll have a think about it. And it usually does it. Has it missed one? Oh, I think it's missed one. It doesn't think that these are together, but that's simple enough. Just go in and say group is a stack. There is no difference to the ones that are auto stacked and your stacks. In fact, it split this one up into two and that should be in there. So let's drag those images into there. And now we've got the one with four and the six that had three images each. And then you would do exactly the same as I did to create the panorama. Only this time it would be to create a HDR image. So that's exactly the same. Right. Output. We have this. We have three panels that you would look at and think that's for exporting. We have the export panel where you can look at images. So let's go get our dogs and let's get let's get that one. And you can do an export to DNG and export to JPEG high quality. You can even create new presets. So the nearest thing to this export panel that you've seen in Affinity, if you are an Affinity user, is um, the export persona. This is the equivalent of it. So you could create a new preset and go here with where you want it saved and what you, if you want it in a subfolder and all of the rest of it. But what you're doing there, you're creating a preset for one or more images to be exported as images. So if that's what you want, it's the export panel. But there's also a publish panel that does something entirely different. You have two options. You can publish to Adobe Portfolio. Portfolio is like a designer CV online. So you publish to a little bit of the Internet, uh, a website of Adobe's, which is Adobe Portfolio. It used to be called Behance, if you've ever heard of that. The other option you've got is that's more showcasing portfolio. The other option from publish is to publish to Adobe stock contributor. What that means is you would have to register as a contributor to Adobe stock and then you upload your images via that option. And you can sell your images. 
Adobe will sell your images on your behalf. So that's a way to become a stock photographer. Very simple. You just need to register. But there is a third option which is not actually showing at the moment because we're in my custom view. But we did have an output view, if you remember. So we'll go to output. Output is a different kind of export. Export, remember, is exporting one image as one image, one image in a different file format. But what you have with the output panel is a way to output different your images, but in a different format, either as a catalogue, as a contact sheet, as a presentation, if that is what you want. Caveat before we go any further, because I can tell from the chat, lots of people are using lots of different versions here. This has been in and out of Bridge since Bridge became an independent application. So originally the output panel was in Bridge and then it vanished and people went absolutely crazy. So Adobe made it available for download separate and you had to install it yourself. And it really was like bring a set of screwdrivers. There was no installer. You had to just manually put the files in the right place. They have now added it back in a different format. So which version of this output panel you see will very much depend on which version of Bridge you've got. So I will take you through what's in this version, which is the latest 2021 version. Don't think if you're using an older version, oh dear, I'm not going to have as many features. You've actually got more features. They were taken out. So if you're using an older version, you have the ability to create a website. Uh, that's gone. We have templates here, but it's to PDF. So at the bottom, if you look at it, it's export to PDF at the bottom. So it offers you this as the default, which is two by two. And if I pick some pictures from here, as I drag and drop them in, so I'm trying to go for vertical ones, I drop it. And let's get some more. Didn't have many vertical ones, did we? There's another vertical one. I think that's it. I'm going to put, I'm going to have to put some other ones in. I could do some creative cropping, obviously. Uh, there we go. Let's add those two in. Right. It's that simple to get that in. Once you've got the images in, if you decide, no, I don't particularly want that one. Right? I want this one instead. You can add that. And what happens is you might think oh, I've overwritten it. No, you've not. You've got a page two. You have page two. So if you want to get rid of that one, you need to remove it. And then anything you've added from page two will then bump to page one and then you're good to go again. So you don't add a page. You add the image and then adding the image adds the extra page. And then you can start doing this. OK, so you can you can line them up like that and then you can navigate through the pages. That panel, the output preview panel, is there for you to interact with your page layout. You can choose whether you see the guides or not. So the guides are either there or they're not there. But the output settings links with this preview. What you set in here will be replicated in the preview so you can see exactly what that looks like. So the first thing is it's using a template of two by two cells. And hence, we've got eight images in there. So that's the first thing. You have other options as well, including greetings cards, contact sheets with four by five, five by eight, fine art, maximum size, even a triptych. And you can do custom. So if we went to this one, your contact sheet, then we've got our eight images at the top, but we have room for another 12 on that A4 page because of the size. And it's the images that you've dragged and dropped into the output preview. It doesn't wipe them out and you have to start again when you change this template over here. But we'll make this two by two so we can actually get a couple more pages. It gives you the size of the paper. So A4 is 21 centimetres by 29.7 centimetres. You can have that the other way if you want. So if all your images, I've created a mixture here, but if all your images are landscape, then you might want to do that. But I'll leave it set to portrait. You can choose your resolution. So you have a range of resolutions that you can choose. 300 is probably good enough. You've got an image quality that you can choose. And again, middling for that I've gone for. You've got your thumbnail placement. You can actually decide whether they go from left to right and then down or whether they go down the first column first and then back to the top of the second column. 
uh, you can rotate them for best fit. So if we put a tick in there, you can see that the landscape ones rotate. Now, that's not going to be great for viewing, but if you wanted to, if what you were doing this for was to create a printout, so instead of printing one image per page costing you a fortune, you wanted to print four and you intend to you know, use a, a guillotine to cut them up, then that is a better way of working because you're getting a, bit, a bigger image. But we're using a PDF, so we'll leave it that way. You could repeat one photo per page, which means you've now got eight pages. So that's more like a sticker thing where you want multiple copies of an individual file. It's just so cool. I love that. So cool. Right. So let's take that one out. So we've got to, we've still got two pages. You can choose whether you include the file name, which is great if you're saying to somebody, you know, make a selection of what you want. But if you're just showcasing it, you don't particularly need it. A finer grain option is to take out the extension, but leave the file name. That just tidies it up a little bit, but I don't think we need anything. Uh, if you are leaving that in and you think, well, you know, the file names are a bit long, you could ch change them so they're much smaller and that way you would fit the name underneath. So just a whole range of options to make this custom to you. Right, we'll leave those turned on so we can see where they are. Shall we change the font? I, d I do like Avenir, but sometimes Avenir isn't available, but I did see it then. Hang on, where's Avenir? Right, it's a little bit lighter, so I do like Avenir, although that's Avenir Black, which means it's bold. So let's go for Avenir um, Book, which is standard. Right, that is only the first section. That's the document. You've then got grids and margins, so you could actually set this up to be three by three if you wanted, just by sliding these across. So that one's four. Let's take it to four. You can take it back to three. So you can do anything you like with that. I'm going to leave that set to two as we started. You can adjust the spacing. So if you wanted a bigger spacing, you can do that horizontal and vertical. So if you're working with that in some kind of strange way, uh, I want them quite close in this case. I don't need too much uh, white space there. Let's take that down even a bit more. You're not going to make it that equal, are you? OK, I'll do it. Don't mind me. Right. You've got the cell size itself um, or you can use auto spacing and you can change the margins. So if you needed different margins for your specific printer, you can do that as well. That's the grid and margin. The next one is the header and footer. And by default, there's no header and footer, but you could include in there Adobe Bridge Demo. Right. You can see that that is appearing on the right, but you can center it and or you can put it on the left. So we'll put that in the middle and again, we'll have that avenir, I think. Why is it going for that? You need to be booked. You need to be nice and standard. Again, you can include a footer. So if you wanted to put something in the footer, you could do. So we'll leave that alone. Or you can include the page number, which is quite handy, to be honest. Uh, at the moment, that's in the header. But if I wanted that to be in the footer on the right, so completely the opposite, I've got all those placement options there that I can use for that. That is probably a bit big for the page number, so I'll make it really tiny. Next option you've got is a watermark. There is no watermark by default, but you can put a text watermark in. So if I put my name in there and it's an Arial one and it's somewhere in there. It is somewhere in there, but I can't actually see it in the preview. Or you can use an image. If you use an image, you can then select a file and put it in there. Now, this one, uh, let's go back to the text one and it's saying placement on the image. Oh, I can see it. It's in the top left hand corner, which is absolutely useless. So if I put it in the middle and I rotate that to 45 degrees, then you can see just about it's not zooming in, is it? No, it doesn't. It's just about in the middle and it's on an angle. And you can change the opacity. Now, black at 100 percent does not look good. So I'll take that down a bit. We'll have it around the 40 mark enough so we can see it, but not obscuring anything. And finally, you've even got PDF properties. So you could secure this with a password. You could have them need a password to open it. So if this is going to a client and you don't want them running off with it or anybody else running off with it, you've got an open password word, a permissions password, 
And you can even choose how it opens up. Now, do be aware with that you can choose how it opens up. You can choose how it opens up as long as they're using the Acrobat Reader. Um, putting it into full screen mode and automatically playing, if you opened it in something like PDF Expert, PDF Expert's just going to say, pardon, and ignore it. So it works, but only if they're using a specific application. And obviously in Adobe's mind, that is Acrobat. And then I'm going to export it. So I'm going to put this in our bridge demo as our first um, output. Oh, let's put output 01 and put it in there. It takes a little bit of time while it thinks about it, processes it and generates the PDF. Uh, it's automatically opened for me and it's automatically opened in PDF Expert because that's what I use. So we have, oh, I missed the E out of demo. That's not clever, is it? Uh, luckily in here, I think we can go to edit and fix that because that's what PDF Expert is fabulous at. There we go. All fixed. Right. But we've got our images. We've got our copyright across it in the middle. We could have made that bigger if we wanted it all the way across. Or, or you could have had that any placement you like on the actual image. Scrolling down, we've got our headings, the titles underneath. We took away, I'm still in edit mode, aren't I? Aren't I? We took away the extension, made it Avenir and made it smaller. And then we head on to page two. So here's our page two. That placement's perfect, isn't it? There we go. That is if you want to use something that was already there. So I'm going to save that and come out of it. So we did make a few changes and it's now saying custom at the top. So if that is what we want, then you can hit the plus button and you can say four by four um, copyright and save. And that is then available to use in the future with a different range of images. And it appears in here. And it tells you it's custom. Right. The other ones you've got in here, probably the one that you would use the most is the contact sheet. So what I am going to do with that there, let's do a command and A, drag all of these on and they're all on there, uh, all on one page as well, by the look of it, because they're quite tiny. I do think, though, looking at that, it's not bad. Five by eight contact sheet. But the, the gap between is mighty big, isn't it? And the other issue I've got with it is I don't really want the names on that one. It's just far too much. So we won't include the file names. That'll give us a bit more space. Uh, and in our grids and margins where we've got this huge space, our cell spacing of one point something centimetres. Let's take that spacing down a bit and that will have a knock on effect of increasing the size of the thumbnails. Uh, and let's just have that. That looks pretty decent. We will put that down as output two. And we're in the right place. It should open up in PDF Expert when it's had to think about it. And we've got a contact sheet. Absolutely perfect. I used to use these all the time. I would make a contact sheet of the contents of a CD or a Blu-ray disc, a DVD disc that I'd burnt images onto as a backup. And I would have one of these and it would have this would be named with the name of the CD, DVD or Blu-ray disc. And I would open this and then I would know what was on each individual disc. Tell me what you would use this one for. Let me know. The other thing that I do with it that's quite nice. Similar idea in here is to go for maximum size one to one like that. I don't want the guides on it. Just go maximum size one to one. That gives me 37 pages. This time it would make sense as we're working through it in our layout uh, document up here, which was rotate for best fit to actually do that. Because if we wanted to print these out at A4, you, there's no point having a tiny image when you, if you rotated it, you could do that perfectly uh, and then export that to PDF. So that's output 003, uh, 03 actually. There we go. What I would then do with that to make it absolutely perfect, which I can't do in here. Um, it, what it's doing is rotating the images. It is not rotating the pages and it would make much more sense to rotate the pages. So that's what I will do with that. Right. So in here, I can go into a thumbnail view of the pages and the ones that need rotating, like all of these, 
pretty much all of those, I can rotate leaving the others. So this will show me these images. Now he needs to go the other way, doesn't he? He doesn't need to go one way. He needs to go that way. Uh, but these are all going one way. Uh, I think that one's going the same way, isn't it? And I would go through and rotate the pages like that. And then I've got a lovely file with all of my images that that's a very good way to just send somebody a whole group of images where you're not actually giving them the images. You're giving them a PDF. They can view the images, but they're a lower quality. They're not the originals to actually make off with and print at massive quality, etc. Uh, and then you close that and you've got your images as you look there. Your thumbnails are the right way around. Amazing. Now, one last thing to understand. Um, when I talked about this in a previous demonstration of Bridge, I got so many comments back with like, oh, so that's how it works. Right. When you're using Bridge, Bridge is looking at your hard drive. It is not a catalogue. It is looking at your hard drive. That means when you first go to a folder, Bridge has to read in the images and generate previews so it can show you the images. And then if you move to another folder and then you went back to the folder with the 5000 images in, would you want Bridge to start reading them in again? No, you wouldn't. It'd take all day. So what's happening in the background is Bridge is building a cache and Bridge builds a cache in one of two ways. It either builds a cache inside the folder that contains the images. So if we go back to my custom view, these are our images. At the moment in view, we do not have a hidden files shown. But if we toggle on hidden files, there is a meta file, which is a sort for bridge. Now, it will also generate other hidden files, including cache files, which mean when I click away to the assets for something else, they were instantly there. They were instantly there. I'm going to just turn off the uh, view hidden file things here. They are already cached. The first time I looked at that folder, it took a couple of seconds to read them in. And it, it takes the longer, the more files you've got, the longer it takes. But the cache you want written out to the folder. And that way, if I have a folder, 5,000 files in it, and I'm about to put it on an external hard drive and send it to somebody else who's using Bridge, the cache file, the bridge cache file will be in that folder and they will be able to use that cache file. So when they open the folder, boom, those images are straight there. The thumbnails are straight there. How all of this is managed is from the preferences. You have two options in here. You have the cache and you have the cache management. So the cache is used, if you remember, I said in two different ways. One is it will write the cache out to the folder containing the images. The second way the cache will work is what if you put a DVD in and it had images on and you looked at folder one and then you looked at folder two. It can't write the cache to the folder. It's a non-writable media. That's where this comes in. The cache size here is the cache. And if you look at the path, it's my user folder, libraries, caches, Adobe Bridge, caches, version 36. OK, you can change that location, as it says, you can change it when you go to manage the cache. You could move it here. You could choose a different location. But what you're giving it is 50 gig of your hard drive to use for its cache. And the options that you have in here are to keep 100% previews in the cache. That means when you're using that loop, it takes no time at all. It's already there. If you didn't have 100% preview and you wanted to preview it to 100%, you'd have to wait while it read the file in. So the tick is in keep 100% previews in cache, and I leave it like that. This compact cache on exit is a recommended option, and yet it's not turned on by default. I suggest you turn that on. Then you've got this option, which is automatically import the cache from folders when possible. So what this means is the cache is imported automatically when the folder having been exported is browsed. OK, uh, whether you want that in or not, on or off, depends on how you choose to have your things set up. 
And the last option is to purge the cash when the item in there is older than 30 days. I don't leave, I don't have that, um, I leave it alone, right? So it is going to purge anything more than 30 days. That means to me that if I go back to an after hours from two months ago, it will have to regenerate the cash. But it's a trade off, isn't it? You've got 50 gig. The older stuff's going to drop off the end anyway when it hits the 50 gig. And I want it kept lean and mean. So I decide I don't want anything older than 30 days. That's one thing that you can do. Right. Your cash management is the first option is to compact it. So what will happen is it will move, remove any obsolete records and any JPEGs associated with them. If you decide that you know everything feels sluggish, you don't like it, you want to get rid of the 100% previews, then that's the second option in here to get rid of them. And then you can purge the local cache file entirely and that will just nuke it and you will have to start again. All of these tend to take um, effect when you've restarted Bridge. So if I said purge the lot, are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> yes, go on. You saw it regenerate. What's happening in the background, that wasn't 100% clear, was it? But it, obviously it builds it fairly quickly. But it nuked them all. So if I go to the assets for 122, two, it will have to read them in. And then it does a second pass. So the first pass brings in quite a blurry image. Um, if we make this really big and then go on to the dog thing. So let's make this really big. So we're looking at one image. And let's go to the dogs folder. So where's our dogs? Now I can't see it too well, can I? But if I go to the folder, uh, come on, that's admin. Can't see a thing. Ah, hang on, dogs. There is dogs. Right. So as I go through, you can, it's doing it really quickly, but it's quite blurred and then it snaps into focus. So it's, do, it's doing pretty well with that. It's going very quickly. I think that one was slightly blurred to start with, but it reads them in and it's regenerating the cache. So every now and then, if you think mm, this is a bit slow, there's something wrong, nuke the cache. Don't be afraid to go into here and look at the cache management and see what to actually do with it. Uh, the automatically import from folders when possible. You can take the tick out of that. And in here, let's get that back to a reasonable size. We then go back and change our view so we can see the hidden files. We should have, it should build a cache outside it. Um, there is a central cache and there is a cache in the folders. So that's how that works. OK, so let's get rid of that. Right. I think we've covered everything. I've got my list in front of me. I think we've done it. Oh, that was that was rather good. Almost on time as well. Yeah, three minutes, three minutes on time. But I'm going to go into here as well. So recap, quick recap. We covered lots and lots of things, but we started with workspaces and the panels. We looked at the meta management. We looked at stacks where you can manually stack documents. Uh, and images. You can use the stacks automatically be generated for you for panorama images and HDR. If you try and stack something automatically and it's not a panorama or a HDR, it's not going to know how to stack it. But you then have the option to use the manual stacks. Then there's the favourites, which I use all the time. I update those favourites every single week. Um, you have options to filter. And the filter is so important because that's like a search and that leads to collections and collections are basically saved filters. You have two types of collection. You have manual collections and you have smart collections. Manual collections, you decide what goes in them. You drag and drop whatever images you want. That does not move them on the hard drive because Bridge is not a catalogue system. The collections are, virtu uh, are virtual. And then there's controlling the cache, which can be incredibly important if you've got performance issues or you're browsing through a lot of images and really just that you want the control of the cache. The cache is very important and it, they give you a lot of control for it. Right. OK, that's been Bridge. That has been Mad March. We went live every day, uh, every Sunday, and they are all available on demand. 
This one will be available on demand as soon as we have finished. We started way back at the beginning of March with Mastering the Export Persona. That one, we did a poll uh, as to what was going to be most popular and that one won. Uh, the second one in the poll was Blend Modes and that one we covered the second week in this. The one that's proved most popular so far is that one, which is Create Creative Tables in Affinity Publisher. Um, that one has, has it, it was the third week. So, th so the other two videos have had two weeks longer and yet that one's had the most views. And then last week we looked at Mastering Master Pages in Affinity Publisher. So, hmm. What's next? Well, we're on holiday. Yay, holiday, fantastic. But we've been pondering. Oh, we have a visitor. Hello, studio visitor. You OK, Lola? I'm exhausted. I'm going to lie down. <laughs> she looks totally exhausted as well. So we've been having a ponder. How could we progress from Mad March? Well, there was only one way. We're doing Mad May. We're going again in Mad May. I, I am so this is so new. I don't even have posters yet. But what I can tell you is the first one's going to be the 2nd of May. And it's going to be a data merge deep dive in Affinity Publisher. That one has been requested the most at the moment. So once we've done the others, it was oh, data merge data merge. So it's happening on the 2nd of May. Mark your calendars. Uh, and there are five Sundays in May. So keep your eye out uh, on the mails and uh, you will get first dibs on what we are doing. In fact, at the moment, I haven't planned the other four. So give me some suggestions. What would you like to see? So everything we've done is available on demand, youtube.com slash Elaine Giles. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell and YouTube will let you know what's going on and when it's going on. You can get in touch with me, um, all of those places. I've still left Twitter on there. I am known to, to visit Twitter once every now and then. Uh, but your best bet is probably elainegiles.co.uk and go to the contact form. We love you guys. If you love us, could you give us a like? Because it really does make a difference with YouTube. They also like comments. So feel free. If you've got any questions, put them in the comments below. That mail I mentioned, you will find at elainegiles.com slash VIP. And uh, that's where you will get your invitations, updates, uh, invitations to, to vote on the poll for what we do next. And you will find out first all about Mad May and what we intend to do. So I'm going to head into questions now. Do I have questions, Mike? There's a few. Right. Let me get in here. Downloading my documents. I can either read them out. No one's hearing you at the moment, but no. carry on. <laughs> right. OK, I've turned your microphone on. I said I can read them out if you want. Uh, why don't you read them out and then I can have a look at them. Tracy as well. said, is there a dirty hack for getting bridge to see affinity files? No. Right. Export them to something else. <laughs> No, Bridge does not see affinity files. It doesn't understand them. I don't know if that is a deliberate decision on Adobe's part, because my initial thought was, well, it's not going to do it, is it? And then I've been using an application for notes called Craft, and I uploaded some affinity files, and I got previews of them all, and I'm like, oh, wow. But no, Bridge doesn't do it, so I'm afraid not, no. Okay, second question from Rene. Curious to find out about the Easter eggs in Adobe Bridge. I've not ventured into Easter eggs, so I have no idea. Is that because it's Easter? It could well be. <laughs> not to... specific Easter eggs. If what Rene means is tips and tricks in Adobe Bridge, then hopefully, uh, Rene, you, you've seen that it does have an advantage over Finder. Is they, that worth an egg? There used to be a good one in Excel 97. Was that the flight sim? Yeah, that was the flight sim. Oh, I got told off for that. <laughs> so did I. Yeah, I went out to a company and, um, you know. Don't show them that. Excel. Oh, dear. They were bored before they'd started. So by the, I promised them, but by the end of the day, I'd show them something amazing. So I, I shown them how to get into this flight simulator. We ended up crashing the entire system. Yeah, we, ne we didn't do that again. <laughs> but I enjoyed myself. <laughs> Tony, right. Tony says, could you export the PDF into Affinity? Yes. 
Okay. You would export it as a PDF and then just open it up into Affinity. So anything that you wanted to do with that PDF, you could then take it into Publisher or, or wherever and make any changes you want. You saw me co correct it in PDF Expert. So it's totally um, editable. There are different kinds of PDF. Uh, and by that, I mean actual international standards for PDF. There are huge variations in what a PDF can do. Some applications that export things like a contact sheet, export it as a contact sheet, fair enough, but it's an image. It's one image and you couldn't edit the text underneath it or the titles. But that actually edit, um, exported it in an editable format where you can edit it. So you saw me do it. It's a very good quality PDF that I mean, you could even if you wanted, if you've only got the PDF, you know, move a couple of the images around. You could really edit that to, to a great degree. So, yes, you can. Tony also says in the chat, simply brilliant with capital with brilliant. <laughs> thank you, Tony. Thank you. Can't see the chat at the moment. but he I says, thank you, it. Elaine and Mike. I did nothing. Yes, you did. You were sat there man manning the, the questions. Yeah, that's true. And uh, final question is from Jose or Jose. And it says, you said that Bridge is totally independent. So if, you dis if they decide to close the Creative Cloud account, I presume, can you still use it to find your files? Hmm. Now, when you say close the cl Creative Cloud, OK, do you, it, you, there's a couple of things you could mean there. You could mean close the Creative Cloud app on your desktop. The Creative Cloud app on your desktop really needs to be running to provide a, a link to Adobe for updates and stuff. If you close it, Bridge will still run for a certain amount of time. But sooner or later, you're going to have to open the Creative Cloud app to be able to update Bridge or see what, what's new in Bridge. That's one thing you mean, you could mean. The other thing you could mean is what if you delete your Adobe Creative Cloud account? In which case, again, Adobe Bridge will run for a certain amount of time and it does that um, and, and it could be minutes, days, weeks. I don't know. I've not done it. But it does that in case you have a problem with your internet. So what a creative cloud is there for is to contact the mothership and get updates and news. They invite you to free training courses and stuff like that via creative cloud. If it's not running or it can't get to the Internet. So some people are actually like offline for days on end up a mountain, aren't they? They will give you a certain grace period during which the software will still run. But eventually it's going to say, you know, you're going to have to contact the mothership uh, just to reactivate Bridge. So you can't really run it in, in perpetuity, if, if you know what I mean, um, forever without that Creative Cloud account. Uh, and you really need it for the updates. Um, but if you mean close the Creative Cloud app, then you can do that. But again, you're going to need to activate it at some point to, for it to contact the mothership. It's just the way that it works. Does the meta include the URL from when, uh, where a photo was uploaded? Uh, so where you've downloaded it from, it depends whether that meta was there to start with. If you want to add it, you can. If it's already there, then yes, it will access it for you. Most photos that come from stock libraries tend to have a lot of meta in them. There are some other photos that are coming from places like, um, isn't it the, uh, is it the Smithsonian? have like a huge library that you can download. They are metered up to the hilt and they will include that URL for sure. Other people who just upload a few files and you download them, they may never have had that information in them to start with. So it, it just depends on the files themselves. But you can add anything you like to it. So if you've downloaded, you know, 50 files from a genealogy site and you want to remember which ones they're from, then just write it to the meta like you saw me write the original file name and then pull that back. Okay. One last question from Tony. Yeah. Um, are the links clickable if you take it into Affinity? Which links would these be? I'm guessing he's talking about exporting, from PDF, exporting the PDF to Affinity. But there would be no links in it to start no. with. There are no links in that PDF. The PDF that I created, the contact sheet and all of that, it didn't have any URLs in it. So there was nothing that was actually clickable. Um, I don't think there's a way to get anything in there that's, that's clickable. There was nothing that was a URL, was there? 
No, the file names underneath that I had on some of them, they were just text. Um, if there was anything clickable, it would depend. I don't know the answer to that because I don't see a way to create anything clickable in there. Tell you what I'll do. We will come out of this presentation at this point. Let's, let's move over there. And we'll see. Uh, mm. So we've exported it. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll go to PDF Expert and we will open that file. So the one that did have some text in it. Where is my mouse point? Oh, good grief. We're doing the mouse pointer hiding thing again. Let's play with Elaine's mind. Right. Um, there is a file. OK, we have some text in it. I can go into edit up there. Oh, I have selected the whole thing. Right. If I. I haven't got the link for what's actually showing on YouTube at the minute. Hang on. Hang on. Got myself. Got myself. Now hearing myself in stereo. OK. Right. I've got the text selected. And one of the options that I've got when I edit a PDF is that I can go in and put a link in it. So I want to put a link on there and the destination of that, the, where it's going to, is to a web link. And the web link it's going to is that, which is this on YouTube. OK. And then I come out of edit mode and I now have a link in there. So let's save that. But I've ad manually added that link in PDF Expert, which is between Bridge and Publisher. So let's close PDF Expert down. And where did I put those? Was it on the desktop? No, it wasn't. I put, I put them neatly away. Good grief. Right. So it's the first one we're looking at. It's that one that's got a link on it. So what I'm going to do is right click and open it with Publisher. And we'll see if the link comes in with it. But remember that that was manually added. And it's actually opened the right one. OK, when you open a PDF, you get this dialog box. I do want to load all the pages. And we'll say favor editability, which might mean that we get that link in. And we'll open it and we will have a look up there. No, that is just text. So uh, no, it doesn't. No. Mm. Is that a problem, Tony? What are you thinking of doing with it? I do like Pentacon 6 Expert. I love the name. Goodbye. <laughs> Glad to have you with us. <laughs> what were you thinking of doing with it, Tony? Um, what I'll say is the, the, the link part of Affinity Publisher was added as an afterthought. Uh, it wasn't there in the initial beta release. And it was the first thing I wrote and said, are you thinking of putting some links in here? And the answer was, no, they weren't. Because Affinity Publisher to them was to output to paper and clickable links don't translate well to paper. And I said, but but I need to make PDFs and I need to have clickable links in them. And if I don't, I'm going to be forced to continue to use Keynote. And about three or four weeks later, there was a, a beta, another new beta. The new beta came out and, and as luck would have it, they had added the PDF link ability. But by comparison to the rest of the interface, it really does look like <laughs> It was bolted on after uh, because it was. It was. So I'm sure they're going to improve that in the future. I mean, they must be working towards some kind of digital output, like straight to EPUB, straight to Kindle. That would be amazing. Um, and maybe they will sort out the look of the links that way. But at the moment, it doesn't look like it. No. But do let me know what you were thinking. Let me know what you were thinking. OK, I'm going to go back over there. So how are we for questions and who's looking forward to Madame A? Uh, you was go you were going to have it to have a, a click to go to an information page about the carpet range. Well, you can add <coughs> it. You can add it once you've got it into Publisher. Um, do you know how to add links in Publisher? Um, let me get in here. Right. Let me make sure that you can see my screen before we go any further, or that won't do any good at all, will it? If we wanted this thing here to be a link out to the video from today. In the text, you have an option. Uh, where are we? To insert a hyperlink. And that gives us this. It was an afterthought dialogue box, literally, at least a line up now. They didn't before. 
Right, you choose a hyperlink type. The first type of hyperlink is to a document page within this file. So if I wanted to say a link that goes to document two, then I could create it. The other things that you can do is go to a URL. So you put in there the URL. The character style is talking about what you what this looks like. And there is a character style in here called hyperlink. So you might as well use that and then click OK. And that makes it look like a hyperlink. And when you export it from Affinity Publisher, it is actually a hyperlink. So if we go and export that, go to a PDF. Now, the, there is a trick here. The trick is to make sure in the preset that you choose a preset that supports clickable links. This will trip you up a million times. If you say press ready, if you say for print, if you say flatten, they do not support clickable links. Digital does. These versions of PDF are the ones that I said are the international standards. And I can't remember off the top of my head which ones support um, clickable links and which ones don't. But what I can tell you is that a PDF that says digital does support clickable links. So we'll hit the export on that. We'll put it, that one on the desktop and we will get rid of Affinity Publisher. And there is our output. We'll open that in PDF Expert and that is then a clickable link. It's opening up Firefox and then without going all inception on everybody, um, it's actually opening up this session that you're watching. There we go. Oh, there it is. But we won't go all inception or we'll all get frightened. Uh, actually, it, it's not playing. It's not got the play button on it. So that's absolutely fine. It, I, I don't want my videos to automatically play. So we could actually have a little bit of a look at that. There we go. We could put that on and it definitely takes you to that link. That was the link that I pasted into it. And there you all are. Hello. This is a bit inception, isn't it? So you can put that in in Publisher. But if you, there's no option in Bridge to particularly put any kind of link in it. But if you want to add it later, then you can do. And you can do that in two different ways. One is if you've got Publisher, you can use Publisher. If you don't have Publisher, let's move down to this one here, and you want to add a link in there, you do have the ability to edit it by going in, uh, click link, and then select the text. It opens up over there. We choose web, paste in the link. So you can do it in either way. It doesn't matter. And then as soon as you come out of edit, you've got a link. Now, the difference between the two is that this one's a link, but you don't know it's a link until you hover over it. And that's why this one is styled with that hyperlink style. So anybody looking at that, it's blue, it's underlined, it's a link. How do you know that? Google. Google decided blue and underlined was a link and we've all lived with it ever since. So that's how you would know that was a link. Obviously, you could work around it here. How could you work around it? Well, we have in here that we know that there's a link in there. But what we could do is do that. If I could type, I would be dangerous. There you go. So click here for catalogue. And there is the actual link. That blue bit is the actual link. So uh, you can either edit the text first and then put the link on it. I'm just going to leave it like that. And now click here for catalogue. And when you hover, you know you should click there because it says you should click there. So that's a different way of doing it in there. So you don't need Publisher. But if you've got Publisher, Publisher is a really nice way of doing it. But it's hardly worth taking it to Publisher if that's all you want to do with it, because you can do that in other applications, PDF Expert being one of them. OK. So what else have we got in the chat? Who's going to be here for data merge? Second of May. Mad May. Oh, Affinity finally got back to Kim. <laughs> With the links pulling through long after I'd sorted her out. <laughs> Bless them. They must be busy. Do you ever get those, those um, I call them snotograms, from, from a company that's like, this is important to us. You know, your, your inquiry is important to us. See you in three weeks. Yeah, I, I got that this week. I did. Oh, Renee, Mad May, PDF export request. PDF expert. Oh, expert. Right. Need, need the glasses, don't I? OK, PDF expert. That's a good one, Renee. That is very good. Mm. Yeah, mine this week was uh, Ulysses. Ulysses have, have made lots of changes. And I must admit, in the last year, I've not been impressed with the changes. It, it, 
I can see why they've done it, but I had a different workflow going on and, and you've now moved my cheese. So can you kindly put my cheese back where it was? Um, but I was beta testing the last one. It was fine. It was absolutely fine. So I thought, great, they've added a really good feature. I'm cool with this. New version came out. I installed it. Not work since. <laughs> beta was fine. Uh, what's happening with the new one is won't back up. There's a file in there it just doesn't like and it won't back up. So the only option I had on the, this dialogue was, you know, forget it. I thought, well, I'll forget it. You know, I don't mind. <laughs> um, or send a support request in. So I thought, oh, never mind. Forget it. I don't mind that, that they didn't back that up. Every 10 minutes, this can't back this file up. Contact support. I can't back this file up. Contact support. So I did. I contacted support. I clicked the button. A mail was automatically generated with all of the information in it. And I hit send. And I got an automated reply back that said, this is very important to us and we'll get around to you at some point. And I thought, I do hope it's in my lifetime. But who knows? I don't know. I don't know. OK, we will put Mad May's PDF expert request in the pot and see, see what happens. Uh, but Tony wants that as well. OK. And Peter wants the finder request. Oh, was was that um, like I did the other night? All of the hidden secrets that are in Finder that Apple make completely undiscoverable. And then when you find them, you're like, oh, wow. <laughs> like that. <laughs> Finder's so good and yet it's, it's so bad all at the same time. I have a love-hate relationship with Finder. It's great when it works. I do have Pathfinder as well, which is incredibly good. If you've got setup, that's included, isn't it? Is Pathfinder in setup? Mm -hmm. I've got this vague idea it is because I remember Jonathan getting giddy. Uh, I don't know. But we'll, we will take anything that you put in there now or contact me. Yeah, uh, any suggestions sense. for Mad May because I'm going to be organising it in the next 10 days. Yeah. So get your requests in. <laughs> OK, Peter. OK. It is. Yeah. I thought it was. So if you've got setup, then you've also got Pathfinder. I could check. I could. What I could do is show you, you do like a head to head with it. Would you really want to invest in Pathfinder for what it can do? Obviously, I've been using it for years. So, yes, I do. But then I, I play around with a lot of files. As you can see, I'm jiggling thousands and thousands of files uh, on, on my 14 terabyte drive that's now working. Is it better than Alfred? Is what better than Alfred? Is Pathfinder better than Alfred? Uh, they're not. They're not comparable. Alfred. Um, Alfred can do Finder stuff if you want, but Pathfinder is actually an entire Finder replacement. So instead of opening a Finder window, you would open Pathfinder, and work with your files in there. One of the huge benefits that Pathfinder had was the ability to have multiple tabs in a single window. Finder caught up with that. But the other thing it has is a dual pane view, which was what I wanted. I wanted it. Because we used to use an app called Directory Opus on Windows. And wasn't there another one? It began with an N, something, something Navigator. Not Netscape Navigator, no, something else. Uh, but Directory Opus was just, oh, that's amazing. So. I was looking for something like that when I moved to the Mac and there wasn't many options. But now you've probably got two really decent options. Pathfinder's at one alternative and um, Forklift is the other. So both of those are very good. We could do a three way comparison, couldn't we? I will have a ponder how we will do this best, but I will put all of these suggestions of yours in the pot. Mike, Mike's making a list as we speak, aren't you, Mike? Yeah. Peter says he may still need to look at Pathfinder. Finder will show me the breakdown, but you can't print out the hierarchy. You can't print out the hierarchy. Oh, um, hmm. would we like to print out the hierarchy for free? Is that what we would like? Not to have to buy another app or fiddle with another app. You know what's coming next, don't you? Right, let's open that up. Right. If I do that and I go into that, I'm testing this before I share it with you because I don't want to look a complete idiot if it doesn't work. <laughs> oh, good, but no T-shirt. But I'm sure there's a way to do that. OK, uh, one option. Let's share this. Do, do, do. Why are you no moving? Oh, I'm sharing the wrong thing. OK, right. What I've got there is all the files that I've been using today. So. 
all folded up. We do have a hierarchy, but there's not much of a hierarchy. Did I put that in there? No, I didn't, did I? Hmm. That's unfortunate. Right, I'm going to do there. Select the lot. Option key. Right arrow. They're all open. Command and A selects the whole lot. Command and C. And then go into a text editor and paste. And you get all of the files. Unfortunately, not indented. Hmm. I'm sure I had that indenting at one point. I wonder if it's the text editor I'm using. Let's try that again. No, I'm not getting them indented. I'm sure there's a way to have them indented. It could involve the terminal. That's it. Could involve the terminal. Not sure, but you can get a file list if that's what you want. And you literally just copy the files, the lot, and then paste them into a text editor of some description, anything. Um, or Excel. You get, you, get, you get it indented in Excel. Don't know if you get it indented. Oh, you want me to crank up Excel. There we go. There's Excel. Or numbers, maybe. Uh, oh, hang on. It's still not passed that across. Right, I'll do that again. I'll do that again. Right, uh, now I've got Excel in the background as well. Right, let me make sure you can see my screen. Come on. Right, you can see my screen. Okay. Right, I've got some files in folders. The other night, sorry, the question was asked, if you have folders within folders, how do you unfurl them all at once? And the answer is you hold the option key down and click the right arrow. So dogs2 is a folder inside admin, and there they all are. And there's dogs1, and we've got some others, HDR complete, and you know it comes all the way down. So there is a full hierarchy, and you only need the one shortcut key. Right, then Command and A, and then Command and C. And then I go into Sublime Text, which is just a text editor, and I can paste. So if you do want a printout, there was, it used to be two ways to do that on, on Windows, didn't there? You could do a printout to a file, or you could do a printout to a, a printer, paper, ink. So if you want a file list and you want to print it out, then just print it out from there. The problem is that's not indented. It doesn't have the structure of those files. It has the actual files. So the next thing I tried was a different text editor. And I tried it in there and that was what I got. So it doesn't indent it in there either. Mike's grand idea at that point was copy them again and then paste them into Excel. If this goes badly, I'm blaming Mike. Right, so go into Excel, uh, blank workbook. Uh, and paste. No, not good. There doesn't seem to be a way. I mean, I can tell which that's a folder and that's a folder, but it's not actually pasting it in like that. There is a way to do it. I'm sure there is, but it might involve the terminal. So uh, I will have a ponder about that and uh, we, we will return to that. But basically what you're saying is tips and tricks for the finder that, that you might not know because they've hidden it, those kind of things. That's that's not a bad idea. We did a find a comparison a few years ago, didn't we, on MapBytes? I think there were a lot more options at the time. Uh, and what we did was it, it ran for like seven weeks. So week one was like, this is the finder. And then week two, we covered PDF, uh, no, um, Pathfinder. Then we did forklift. And then we did like the three or four other alternatives that there were. But that was many, many moons ago. Must have been about 2010, 2011. It was a long time ago. I don't suggest you dig it out and watch it because it would be really out of date. Uh, but yeah, we, we could do one of those. You never know. You never know. Right. OK. Any more questions or is that it? That was I've it. got a tick in every question that's been asked. Fantastic. I've also got some follow ups here and comments and thank yous. So thank you very much for all the thank yous. Oh, Paul says all the Mad March videos were great. Uh, we've heard Tony simply brilliant. Thank you. Uh, and Kim says thank you for all of Mad March. Excellent. Well, Mad May. Coming, coming to a screen near you soon. So make sure you subscribe to the channel. Make sure you are subscribed to the newsletter. And um, I, I will send things out as and when. So I know the first one's going to be data merge because I have had 27 mails about data merge. Honestly, it's like more data merge. Data merge. So uh, the first one is going to be data merge. Uh, and then, then we can think about it. 
Okay. Right. We will be going live in another hour and a half. We need to eat something first, don't we? Oh, Dee's just arrived just as we're heading off. <laughs> oh, poor Dee. It's all right. It'll be available on, on demand as soon as I press stop here. And Kim's looking forward to Mad May. Excellent. Excellent. Right. OK, then. In that case, I'm going to say uh, good afternoon from me. And good afternoon from me. Yes, they can hear you, Mike. Carry on. Not a problem. OK. <laughs> and we will both see you next time. Stay safe, guys.